Hello, I am Lucas. That is Jeff, and this is Make Your Own Damn Podcast. Jeff, what is going on tonight? Oh, man. Oh, this is an exciting episode tonight for me personally, because uh, for anyone that knows me or anyone that's been a longtime listener, I'm sure I've mentioned it many times before that I'm originally from middle of fucking nowhere, Pennsylvania, and I spent first probably good 24 years of my life, I think, living all over the state, and we are finally covering um, the most famous Pennsylvania genre exploitation filmmaker of all time, George Romero. And joining us for this episode, we have another Pennsylvanian, also from the godforsaken parts of Pennsylvania, as all the great horror minds. It's all pretty godforsaken. Pen- <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is very true. This is very true. We have um, the writer, director, special head special effects artist, probably did a lot of other shit that I don't have time to list off of the uh, <laughs> independent uh, Christmas horror horror movie. Uh, dreaming of a white doomsday. I got it right that time. We have Michael Lombardo here, and Michael Lombardo is also an author, um, working with um, Thunderstorm Press. And but we're actually not going to be really talking about any of that with Mike. I, I'm sorry, Mike. Um, but right. we're going to be talking about George Romero, and um, we were having some conversation behind the scenes about what movie do we want to have be the focus. Uh, for our conversation, and we picked the uh, 19... Oh, oh, shit, I already forgot. 1977? Yeah, 1977 pseudo-vampire flick, Martin, uh, which we all have kind of vague, weird memories of, and we'll get into this. <laughs> but uh, as we like to start off every episode, um, Mike, what's your, like, history with uh, George Romero, and, like, what's your history with the movie Martin? Ooh, my history with George Romero is a long history. Um, when I was a kid, I rented Dawn of the Dead, and it quite literally changed my life. Um, I have been a rabid fanatic for George Romero ever since then. Um, love all of his films. Martin is actually one of the ones that I'm the least familiar with, because when I first saw it, uh, the quality was sub-VHS, so I couldn't uh, the black and white scenes, I actually couldn't even see what the fuck was happening, so I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> so... Oh, God, was, uh, I think I remember that old, old version going around, like, 20 years ago? Yeah, it was it was a very bad quality, um, I don't even know who put it out, I think it was a, I want to say it was a DVD, um, but I guess that Second Sight finally put out, like, a they remastered it in 4K and put out a really gorgeous box set. So I decided, why would I not spend a significant amount of money on uh, a movie that I haven't watched in 20 years? Because George Romero made it. So here we are. And I'm fresh from seeing it again for the first, really for the first time. Let's just say that because my first experience was not, was not, doesn't count. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. What about you, Lucas? Like, what's your like um, George Romero slash Martin? Uh, okay, history? so George Romero that would have come at around my my ninth or tenth birthday. I got a stack of Universal monster movies and Night of the Living Dead on VHS. Hell yeah! Hell uh, yeah! And basically never looked back. Right? I mean, like, how, how old were you again? I was nine or ten. I don't. I don't. My, oh like, god that's a good age yes yeah perfect. like everything before 12 like is just weird and foggy like all feels like the same year so i don't i don't really know but um uh i i must have been nine or ten and yeah i uh i saw this vhs copy of night of the living dead and just kind of never looked back like i mean i i sometimes grumble even to this day about how like tired i am of zombies but like if i'm if i take an honest look at myself like my favorite horror, a lot of my favorite horror movies are still zombie movies, specifically ones. You, they're endlessly rewatchable. Like, I'll go back, I'll watch Dawn of the Dead three times in a week and it doesn't yes. bother me because it's that good. It's but so you put good. anything new, I'm like, yeah, fuck this. Like, this yeah. Is no, uh, Dawn, Day, and, and Night. I mean, and I Night, love, yeah. Even the remake yeah. of Night is great. Oh, the remake of Night is great. Uh, Tom Savini directed that one. Oh, so good. But, but Romero was oh, involved. I, like yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get too too much in the weeds here yet. We'll we'll save that for later. Um, but 
Martin, my history of Martin, I actually saw a screen cap of it for the first time in this. Do you remember in the 90s, they would, and they probably still do it now, I don't know, but they would, they would put out these books that were like every vampire movie ever. And like, you know, I, I don't know. I think you're talking about like the... generic, make easy money film god books. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things still classic the... book fair ones or the like, Ooh. there's like the little books that they would have like vampires, zombies. That's how I found out about Dawn of the Dead as a kid, a guy at the book oh. fair, like a little, those little pocket books. No, so this was a um, this was actually a hardback. It was a thin hardback, but it was called like Vampires in Movies. I don't remember what it's called. Oh, okay, I, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Um, but um, there was a screen cap of him drinking from a woman's wrist, and his he's got like kind of the the bloody beard kind of going on. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, that looks really creepy because I must have been about the same age. Um, and dude, I thought I saw this movie. I don't think I did. Like, I was watching it uh, yesterday, oh, and I was just like, I, "This is not familiar to me <laughs> at all." Like, other than like what I've heard, you know. <laughs> um, but like, as far as like the visual Inter- experience, I was like, I don't think I've actually seen this. How about you? So Jeff? yeah, I, I, yeah. Finish off here. Um, do my George Romero experience first, because I've got a very uh, personal connection to George Romero, at, at least his films. Let me put it that way. Never got to meet the man. Has any one of us here actually were any of us here fortunate enough to actually meet him? I did. Um, you did. I have to, yeah, it was. Okay, I, hold was that at, thought. Hold okay, that thought. Okay. Hold that thought. We're gonna get to that later. Um, okay, you're the only one of us that did uh, get to meet uh, him. Met him. Um, yeah, as um, like I said, from. Uh, Middle of nowhere, fucking Pennsylvania, lived all over the state. We got our fucking horror pride in Pennsylvania. There is right. so many great, great horror and genre people from Pennsylvania. I will say emphasis on from because there's a few, only a few of them that chose to stay in Pennsylvania. Mike, you're <laughs> one of them. And George Romero <laughs> was another one. That, and Brian Keane, we can also throw in there. And I think you all are crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that's a, that's a whole other thing to go into a whole other list. But uh, George Romero, um, how I first got into him, of course, first night of the Living Dead. I've got a great story about it. Is that on um, uh, my both my parents? My parents were divorced when I was an infant. Um, growing up, both of them know horror movie fanatics, and so I was raised with horror movies. And my mom started giving me a Halloween present every year, and it was a um, horror movie that she thought I would see some of the uh, thought I should see. Um, the only two I remember her getting me was the second one was the second years was the original, uh, Hills have eyes, which was my mom's personal favorite horror movie of all time. The West Craven Hills have eyes. But the first year, which I believe I was either 11 or 12. I truly don't remember which she got me night of the living dead. And she's like, I want to watch this with you. And I watched Night of the Living Dead. And I still remember to this day the ending scene of Night of the Living Dead, which I still think is one of the greatest shock horror twist endings yeah. in the, the entire horror film genre period. And I remember sitting there in shock as a kid of like, they just shot him. They just shot him. And that whole thing I've discussed before on the show about how impactful that was to me of the credits start to roll and you see the still images of his of um uh dragged out with his Ben the name Ben's, Ben's, yeah. Ben's the name of the character I believe. Yep, ben, uh, uh, the fire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like oh my God, that just like um just blew my mind in the most positive way, most positive yeah. way. And like my parents really set me on the being a horror fan. And so Night of the Living Dead has just etched in my memory. And it's one of what I honestly consider, and I've talked about it many times before. I personally have this argument that there have been three perfect horror films made, period. I argue it's the original Night of the Living Dead, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and John Carpenter's remake of The Thing. And those are the three perfect horror films that have ever been made. And this is a hill I'm willing to die on. I, I, I see you thinking there, Mike. Um, but so I have, like, massive respect for George Romero. 
And um, I've watched, I was reviewing it today. I am actually quite familiar with a large chunk of it, of his filmography. I've seen almost everything he's made. I also lived in Pittsburgh for a period of two years. And um, like that city, which George Romero makes movies about that city and the areas around that city. And it's something I really appreciate about him. And I'm going to be talking about that definitely as throughout this episode. Um, uh, I've also have personal experiences with Tom Savini. Um, we're not, we're, no one's advertising with us. Um, I don't give a fuck saying Tom Savini is a fucking asshole. I can, I'm going to have a story later about him out of college. I also have Just a story. Wait. Um, yeah, Tom Savini is a fucking asshole. Uh, George Romero, though, people only spoke great of. I loved how he represented uh, Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, especially like the and like we have weird horror history in Pennsylvania and him being w one of our big beacons. I fucking love now in regards to Martin. This Martin was one of those movies I always missed until I was like in college and I've talked about this before. Like when I was in college, I did like big, massive movie watches and Martin was one of those like picking up movies I missed and it didn't leave a big impact on me. I didn't really like it or dislike it. I just remember it just being like, eh, and I don't think I've watched it since college and watching it again for this episode. I'm not sure if I liked the movie, but I got an awful lot out of it and i'm really looking forward to discussing that with all three of you i'm sorry with all three all three of us the yeah. two of you you know what sure. i mean i know what you meant and um, so that this, concludes my point there. <laughs> yeah i mean this was the f i mean and we've been doing this show almost three years now and it's crazy that we're yeah. finally getting to romero but um uh i um, this was one of the first times like i i almost considered like postponing our call because i was like i kind of feel like i need to watch that again to yeah. like really like pick up on everything it. like it because like romero cites it as his favorite of his movies and well, i don't know I, like i, I have I've, some information on that that we can get into later but just one thing i just want to interject real quick can i just read a quick synopsis um yeah for anyone that's listening that maybe is not familiar with what exactly the movie's about. So at least we have that framework for moving forward for everyone, anyone wants to discuss. That sound all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before we get ahead of ourselves. So here, here yeah, yeah. So here, here's a quick synopsis and we'll get into the discussion. <clears throat> Young Martin is entirely convinced that he is an 84 year old blood sucking vampire without fangs or mystical powers. Martin injects women with sedatives and drinks their blood through w wounds inflicted with razor blades. After moving to Braddock, Pennsylvania, to live with his superstitious uncle, who also believes Martin is a vampire, Martin tries to prey exclusively on criminals and thugs, but stumbles when he falls for a housewife. Okay, let's get into it. So right out the gate, I'm going to say that's a really bad synopsis because that yeah. is what I read. Like I read the back of the box again and I'm like, ah, you know, the movie's very aimless. And I, I like, love that you said that we have a great time here critiquing synopsis. And I agree with you. I think that's an extremely bad synopsis as well. I, think that's, that, I mean, it makes sense. Like you have to try to like tighten it up to make it into like a story that was not interesting, but that's not the movie at all. <laughs> like. No. It's it's really not. Um, but I, I'm with you, Lucas. Like, I think I need to watch it again, and I want to blow through the extra features. Like I said, I'm very, very familiar with most Romero stuff, with the exception of Martin, Season of the Witch, There's Always Vanilla, and The Amusement Park are, I believe, the only ones I have not seen. And um, it's – this was – there's a lot going on. It's kind of I'm hard sorry, to which one, which ones which – one, which were the ones you haven't seen? Um, there's Always Vanilla, Season of the Witch, which is also Jack's Wife is the original title, and uh, The Amusement Park, which I have. I just didn't watch it yet. That was the unreleased uh, – like, it's like a PSA or something he did yeah. for, like, elder abuse. Yeah. Um, but I yeah, haven't um, seen that I, I actually so. – I haven't – I haven't seen Amusement Park yet either, but I'm from what I know about it, admittedly I'm talking about a movie that I haven't seen yet. 
I actually kind of argue it doesn't really count as a Romero movie since he was kind of hired on to by the Lutheran Church uh, make a re yeah. pre existing. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't. I it's not like a movie. Season of which they advertised it as the lost film by George Romero. I'm like, now nah, this is like a commercial project, it's like an industrial that he did. It, it, but, it's uh, an industrial film, exactly. I have seen Season of the Witch. I have not seen There's Always yeah, Vanilla. I haven't. I haven't seen Vanilla and I haven't seen the amusement park. So Vanilla and the amusement park are the only two I haven't seen. Um, and I, I have his, I have his full filmography pulled up right now. Um, um, do, do, shall I go over it real quick, just for uh, the sake of the three of us and for everyone listening, I can just list them off for real quick. Yeah. Now are you listing direct directorial films? I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to do directorial, just directorial okay. only. So it's, um, Night of the Living Dead, 68. There's Always Vanilla, 71. Season, Season of the Witch, 73. The Crazies, 73. The Amusement Park, 75. I say that's debatable. Martin, 77. Dawn of the Dead, 78. Night Riders, 81. Creepshow, 82. Day of the Dead, 85. Monkey Shines, 88. The Dark Half, 93. Bruiser, 2000. Land of the Dead, 05. Diary of the Dead, 07. Survival of the Dead, 09. What's interesting is that his there's like three to five year gaps between a lot of those projects, which makes me feel really fucking nice. Because yeah. I haven't done I'm, <laughs> I'm just now I think, we, I think all three of us feel that way, yeah. From White Tuesday, I'm like, thank God. If it's good enough for Romero, it's good enough for me. <laughs> oh, dude, I am going to have a story for you later in this episode that's going to make you feel so good. <laughs> very good. I got I got a great behind the scenes story that is very inspirational for anyone that's feeling frustrated about where their career is at about this movie. Um but but we're right now just like kind of like our our feelings on this and just like kind of like what we got out of this and yeah. I, it is in an interesting spot in his career that he is think- like go ahead Lucas, yeah. Yeah, I think a good spot to start would be, like, kind of where I was going before I, like, yeah, like, because we needed to talk about the synopsis. But um, I, I did want to say, like, does anybody have any thoughts as to why he might have considered this his favorite film? Um, I don't know. It's it's weird because I feel like there's, like, very distinct phases of his career. And I think that, like, post-night, like, the I haven't seen Season of the Witch or... um. There's always vanilla, but it definitely seems much more about like suburban ennui, a little bit mm-hmm. like that from which, what I've gathered. Which season of the movies. witch does that as well, yeah. And that's what Martin very much feels like. That like Martin felt like a very frustrated filmmaker, like telling a story. Like it, it felt personal in a weird way because I don't, I don't know the, why he made the movie necessarily, but like I can just feel within the characters and stuff that there definitely is a very heavy, like, um, I mean, I'm sure that you guys can relate to this. Like I was persecuted mercilessly by religious people when I was a kid because I liked horror movies and shit. And I was told I was the devil for the things that I was interested in and shit. And I definitely feel like the character of Kuda and this is probably based on people that he knew in his real life, especially with Romero playing the priest character in this and like how like flippant he is and like just dismissive of, like, there's a lot of, like, little moments in here that I'm, like, I'm getting, I'm painting a picture of Romero's views here with, in regards to this sort of thing. And, uh, I don't know, I feel like it might be, like, it very much felt like just kind of, like, a slice of life of, like, being in, like, Pittsburgh and, like, in an economically depressed area and, like, that kind of shit and just trying to, like, do your thing. Maybe, maybe not, like, you know, sedating, raping, and drinking the blood of women, but, like... You know, you do you like your thing, you know. <laughs> so, so you think that that I mean, I, and I think it, it is probably the consensus. But I did have a random shower thought earlier that I am going to share. Like, so it, y'all, y'all are definitely like of the mind that he's definitely killing people. I oh, yes, that, he abs- I, yeah. I think so. Okay, I I think he is too. I couldn't quite. That was one of the things that I'm not clear on. I need to watch again. But like the train, I'm like pretty sure she's the dead he's trying to clear. make it look like a suicide that's exactly what happened yes yeah. yes he he, yeah. he makes it look like a suicide um and in fact he like stages the scene throughout several points in the movie what right. i'm unclear about and maybe we'll get to later in this movie i'm firmly in opinion that he was killing people i'm really unclear is he a vampire or not 
Uh, I'm actually super unclear on that. Which let let's hold off on that discussion. As no. in like an actual as in like an actual creature. Uh, but I, I want to hold off on that. But let's focus on the killing people. So on the killing first. thing, I was pretty convinced he was until like the ends, like uh, where I was just like, oh, so she. The woman he was having an affair with kills herself, and then that's the victim that his, but Kuda his cousin his uncle, Kuda, right? Man, yeah, whatever the fuck he is to him, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Kuda. he says it's his cousin. He says it's yeah. his cousin, and his cousin obviously is much older than him. And this is one of the things we'll get into the vampire discussion later with the weird age discussion that goes on in the movie. But he says that like if somebody like if you kill somebody in Braddock oh. that he's gonna he's gonna kill him he's gonna stake him and what I was wondering about the end of the movie I was I'm firmly on board that he's killing people I'm wondering though is it supposed to be some sort of weird I, I don't really have a full theory to this and maybe one of you maybe both of you can help me out with this that he was essentially moving past it in some mental way and he didn't know he killed her because her death is all the signs of how he stages deaths throughout the entire film oh so i would be on board with that if not for the character's interactions prior because she definitely feels like she is a very lonely depressed housewife and she's like she basically says when they're laying out in the field, like, I wish that you would just kill me or something like she yeah. doesn't. She's very clearly like not having it. And I think that she definitely did commit suicide. I don't think oh, that he you, actually you, killed her. You know what? You actually just convinced me because also just point out, out what I know is one of George Romero's main artistic influences is EC Comics. And that would be a very EC Comics type of ending to have that brutal irony of yep. I've been staging suicides. Now I've fallen in love with a woman and she commits suicide in such a way that gets me killed. Yes. That would be um, OK. Actually, I'm certain now. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. You helped cement that ending to me. I'm certain that's what happened at the end there. And I think the the problem with that, though, like the whole ending is it's all very, like the movie goes for like an hour and 20 minutes. Then it's just like, boom, it's over. And it's just so, like. Lucas, but, yeah. what do you feel about that conclusion? We came the, the, the we came, do you does that work for you or. Yeah. Yeah. No, do you have any issues with it that? It does. Like, I don't. Yeah, I don't think. Um. Like, I definitely, you know, uh, don't think he killed her. Like, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I was alone on that one. All right. <laughs> yeah. But um, so that actually fits, though, like, yeah, with the EC ending. Like, yeah. that would be a very EC Tales from the Crypt style ending. I think, because I definitely have that feeling where I'm like, really, that's what finally gets him? Because it, it's weird, because the whole time I almost feel bad for him, but then I'm like, oh, yeah, no, he did some, like, really heinous shit. <sighs> yeah, no, Romero did a really Forget. good job, like, with this character, right? Because, like, there were times where I kind of felt the same way. Like, there were moments where I was like, I feel bad for this guy. And then I was just like, oh, yeah, but he, like, killed that girl on the yeah, train. He, like, I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, he actually is yeah. doing all this shit that he's being accused of. It's I'm yeah. like, oh this is weird. I don't, cause it's, it's not a very, it's not a normal plot structure. It's very strange. Like there's no, there's no questioning whether or not he's doing it. So it's not like, is Kuda crazy? It's like, yeah, he is, but he's also correct. And that's yeah. right out the gate. You know that. So it's like, Oh, okay. So he's a shit bag, but it's justified. <laughs> so it's a really weird. Yeah. And, and Kuda, who Mike just reference is the uh, quote unquote cousin, which we'll get into in a bit over that is a family member that takes in the, Martin, who may or may not be a vampire, but is definitely doing horrible things. I will just say this, though. Now, I'm of the opinion of fuck this guy from the beginning of the movie. I never sympathize with him at all. I'm like, you are just a monster. And you're just playing the victim. You are just being in denial about how awful you are. I'm like, fuck this dude. <laughs> so you're not wrong, but, like, I just... I, I <laughs> there's... There's such long stretches of the movie where not that he's not doing anything. It's just him right. getting basically psychologically abused. And like you forget and about you forget. like, oh yeah, I forgot about those two death scenes like an hour ago. <laughs> like Yeah. No, it does it does interesting things with its um 
with uh with time i guess like the passage of time uh to make you like kind of essentially forget that this guy is a a mass or a, i'm sorry a serial killer mass he, killer yeah, he, somebody who does yeah, it all yeah, in no, one. No, he, he, he's a serial killer and we we do know from so we're accepting the idea that he that the murders he's committing in the movie are actually happening um and we should we should we still should address why that's even the question in the first place, because that also uh, that, that actually just that was also is he or not vampire? Um, those two things are directly tied together. But so we accepted those murders are happening, and his cousin, family member, uh, the way they're referencing things, they wouldn't be aware of the movies that we see in the movie, which means they're other murders have happened or have happened or at least he strongly suspects it and so that means this has been going on for some period of time that this guy has been killing women killing um well drugging women raping them and then murdering them is specifically at least what he's describing is what he's doing to them yes so but what's interesting about that though is you're implying that they're that they knew that there were previous murders, but the way that the other cousin, the girl, uh, Romero's ex-wife, I forget her name, Chris, Christine Forrest, she doesn't react to him as though he's like a dangerous criminal. And honestly, Kuda doesn't really either. Yep. So I think that he has the, the implication that I got out of it was that he is suffering from some kind of mental illness where he thinks that he's 84 and all that shit. And that's, but Kuda's views on that are because of his crazy old superstitions. But I don't know that he was ever caught for doing anything. So I was wondering, I'm like, did he like get institutionalized prior, and then he's getting sent there because so, he has nowhere so else to let's go? Let's go directly. Let's go directly into that. That's a fantastic transition from the previous conver- conversation. Is he or is he not a vampire, as in a supernatural <laughs> entity of some sort? And directly related to that, the flashbacks slash dream sequences that show kind of vampire horror movie cliches are those things past memories, which is sometimes implied in the movie. Are they religious hysteria, which is sometimes implied in the movie? Um, (laughs) What do we think? Because to be honest with you all, I walked out of the movie and this was the thing that I actually found most interesting about the movie at the end of it i actually really was not sure i don't know if he's a vampire or not at the end of the movie that's the reason i mentioned wanting to see it again like i feel like i'm just like i don't i don't know (laughs) i remembered a lot of the movie very clearly from when i was younger i realized i remembered like everything with the movie um the plot all that um, it was rewatching it now, being a more, shall I say, savvy, nuanced movie viewer. Um, it was that whole, is he or is he not a vampire that I found most interesting and I was paying the closest attention to throughout the whole movie. And at the end, I was like, I don't know. And I'm like, did I miss something? I don't think I missed anything. I think it's left very purposely vague. Um... Uh, and I kind of dig that about the movie, but I didn't know if like any like what your all opinions were because I have to be honest, my opinion is I don't know. I'm kind of leaning towards yes, just also because that makes a better movie. But I don't know. See, I disagree. I think that it's better if he's not because really? that's more disturbing. But I my view on it, what I think is, I think that he is a serial killer. Like I don't know. It, what so we it, all honestly, agree on that. Yeah, I, what it really reminded me of was the Theodore Sturgeon book, Some of Your Blood. Have you guys ever read that? I have not. No. Like 1954. It's it's uh, it's a, it's very short, but it's basically I'm gonna spoil it. Is that's cool? Go for it. Go okay. for it. It's um it's told as a series of letters, and it's basically it's a guy who's in the military and he gets discharged, and it's letters between like the the court, like the military court, and him, and then it goes back and forth with like letters from him and like his girlfriend. And basically, you find out that this guy was drinking animal blood. Like, he got caught doing something. They don't know what it was. They found these letters, and then they discharged him. And this whole time, he's basically going through, since he was a kid, he, like, drinks blood. He would, like, kill a toad and, like, drink its blood. And, like, he was, that was, like, his thing. 
And then eventually, like as the book goes on, you find out like, he keeps they, they keep talking about the contents of this last letter. And basically the last letter is he said it's to his wife or his girlfriend. He said, I miss you. I wish I had some of your blood. And they realize that he's been drinking her blood for years. And like it's a really fucking disturbing ending. I mean, it's been out. The book came out in, like the 50s. So it's like, whoa, like what the fuck? Yeah. But that's what it reminded me of. There's people that have like vampirism. The mythology of that partially comes from people that have like anemia and stuff. And they, they their body craves iron and blood. Like that's a thing. And I feel like the way that Martin describes it, he's like, I'm getting shaky again and stuff. I feel like it's more like it felt more to me, like something like medical or that it is a, like a serial killer or if he's going long enough without killing anybody. But then when he starts sleeping with that housewife, he doesn't have the urge nearly as strongly and he can't pick yes. a victim because he's yes. not sexually frustrated anymore. He's actually, yeah. he's, he's doing the sexy stuff without the needles and the sleep. Those lines are so fucking disturbing. Like that. Yes, they are. Yes, and, they and are. Really dark. Um, and I want to also tie it into just real quick. Um, this won't take much explanation, but I think that's a really brilliant thing that uh, George Romero all tied together there with the drinking oh. of the blood, him having a starting to have a sexually satisfying relationship. That the origins of. Um, like vampirism, a lot of it with when we look at like the modern artistic inspirations of it, and keep in mind this is all pre Anne Rice, so this is pre the um like interview the, the very yeah interview with the vampire yes that would very have been sexy. oh gosh this would have been like almost right before interview with the vampire if I'm yeah, not this, mistaken this is, like I think this is right before because um, the book came out up, in the late seventies so I'm I'm looking up right now when the interview with the vampire book came out and it of course came all the results are in, in 1976 which they were making this movie yeah. when it came out it came out one year later so this is a bunch of different things going on um just, i i was saving this for later but it's actually a quite great place to interject it this is just a weird historical coincidence going on is that while this movie was being filmed and the year this movie came out and the year after was when the serial killer was caught was Richard Chase. Do either one of you know about Richard Chase? Is he the vampire of uh, Dusseldorf or whatever? Um, he's uh, he, Well, he's the uh, vampire of Sacramento. That's what and, it was. And <laughs> he would... <laughs> um, he he, he uh, would cannibalize people drink their blood he would catch wild animals roadkill blend them up in a blender and drink them he was convinced that he was constantly losing blood and it was like the, the yeah, man yeah, very that. um very mentally ill it's actually a super sad story because if you actually learn about the story he actually throughout his entire life and even while he started committing murders was seeking help for what he was oh, wow. experiencing and that we there was just no mental um help infrastructure in place and he just kept going crazier and crazier it's, it's actually a really sad story though a lot of people get really fucking murdered and raped and tortured yeah. all the fucking hell but it could have been prevented but it's actually not that different from the story in I the wonder, movie Martin. I wonder if that, and it just uh, so happens it the movie was being made and came out at the same time. And for the record, I looked it up. I can't find any documentation that Richard Chase saw Martin. Interestingly wow. enough, though, Martin's calling for help. He's talking to the, the late he night is. psychologist. That's why I'm like, it's so, oh, oh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about yeah. that, which is actually my favorite part of the whole movie, which also makes it the most confusing part to me of the whole movie is, is he or is he, isn't he a vampire? So, I mean, I think that I love that he's doing that because I think what Romero does really well in this movie is he's demystifying the legend it's like he did with zombies like he took mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like haitian voodoo stuff and he turned it into night of living dead and he he brought it to suburbia so with the vampire stuff he's like the whole movie he's like there's no magic magic isn't real look i can eat garlic i can look in the mirror there's yeah. you know i'm not burning up in the sunlight like none of these things he has the plastic fangs at cuda and he's like this is all bullshit which is what makes me think that the whole point is that this was all just psychological like 
you know, unwellness on his part and not right. actually that's, tampering. And, that, and that's the thing that gets me. I'm going to bring that up is he says there's no magic, but the age thing. I think he was just crazy. Movie. Like, I think he was just and, actually like. And just, that's where I'm like, I'm not sure. Sh- I, I am as a viewer not sure what to believe. Because I think the, the flashback sequences, the black and white segments are very clearly supposed to be homages to like classic cinema like dracula it's all very gothic i think that's how he views himself is he is so used to being persecuted he's a monster which he actually is that's the part that's fucked up about this is that he actually is regardless of whether or not he's (laughs) supernatural he is a piece of shit yes we all can we can all agree on that we can all agree he's an absolute piece of shit it's an odd plot structure for that um but then when he's talking to the, the late night radio host, like the, what is that guy's name? John, or Randy Savage, whatever the dude that oh, has. Oh, like, I can, uh, give me one that's moment. That's a wrestler. I can pull it up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the late, uh, John Savage, the dude that does the late night talk show stuff, like on the radio. I used to listen to him all the time in high school because all the crazies would call in. And like that obviously was a thing back in the 70s too. And I think yeah. that's where people that are, have a few, you know, they've got some issues. They're. I don't know. They're, the, now they're on the internet, but back then right. you call into the radio and then he's being exploited. They're like, hey, it's the Count. Everyone yeah. wants to hear the stories of the Count. No one takes him seriously because they just think he's a kook, but he's actually murdering people. So again, I feel like there's so many clues that it is just real life and he's just, you know, a bad person and not necessarily a vampire. At least that's how, uh, what it I would be more. That. I mean, it would definitely be more in line with Romero, uh, when he's not working with Stephen King, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, at least his sensibilities, you know, um, where they're, they, they tend to be less supernatural. Yeah, well, the way even Romero as the priest, he's talking when, when Kuda's like, hey, so, you know, do you believe that demons can take over a man's soul? And he actually laughs. Yeah, he's even like, the, pri- oh, yeah, the priest mean, is I like, I think that that's definitely is something that needs to be taken care of. He's like, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't really believe in like all that crazy shit. Like, yeah, no, I mean, like, because there is that whole, like, wave, I guess, around this time, this time where, like, the Catholic priests were starting to be like, no, that's metaphorical. Yes. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, it's the, the old yes, yes, versus the new guard. We're, we're, yeah. we're in post-exorcist universe, which right. may sound, like, shocking, because uh, this is also... They before the any of us yeah, talking... They the exorcist, yeah. This yeah. is before, yeah, this is before also any of us were talking about this right now we're born but there's enough documentation this is 100 percent true like the exorcist the movie coming out did actually have a social impact and religious organizations did have to publicly address over how real or not real they viewed exorcisms of their particular faith which yeah as we said is, is actually when it's brought up in this movie is in reference to it's 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 not i shouldn't say in reference it's in context of that controversy right. like it's not it's of, not just a horror movie being cute and referencing another horror movie it's like it actually like no. makes sense with what this movie is trying it's, to is say is this thing it, are exorcisms real or not which directly ties into are vampires real or not which right. the character we're watching in this movie um oh yeah this is fun um, Lucas, so, um, I wanted to hear, I feel, and if you don't, that's fine. And I have more stuff to immediately move on to, but I, I feel like you would, you should have more to say about the, um, the call-in show because the shock jock call-in yeah. the vampire <laughs> seems like a hundred percent up your alley, Lucas. And I want to know. Yeah, no, know I scenes. mean, it just, uh, it, I think it was just a really cool way to do it. Like, cause, uh, uh, I think a lesser movie would have just had him doing voiceover narration and i think just having like the the shock jock as a sounding board just added a lot like it's just added my more favorite character. part of the movie yeah it's my it's my favorite part as well i actually i and, and actually like reading around around online just like seeing what people had to say about the movie people that like this movie fan discussions online um it seems overwhelmingly people who really love this movie their favorite moments are are him talking with the radio host yeah, and it's like, just I such mean, a simple part, easy thing but it's so interesting 
Well, there's even that part where he essentially confesses, um, yeah. you know, to what he's yeah. doing, and yeah. and and he's like, it's wait, great. what do you mean with the needles and the the the, the razor blades and the, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although that's actually something interesting because he does confess over the air. That would imply there's never any repercussions for what he did prior. Like no one found the body in the train that we ever hear about. No one talks about the other woman. Yeah. So maybe he actually didn't kill anybody. Maybe it is just completely in his fucking no, head. I, I honestly really just take it away that he was just getting away with it. And um, honestly, it, like and this is because I'm a true crime nerd. I can actually pull this out here and be like, this is tor- this is in the area where serial killers were kind of really first coming out. And a lot of the concepts of serial killers and how law enforcement worked that we think of as modern people, like, well, I shouldn't say modern people, current people, um, didn't really exist at all at the time period. And so an idea of somebody being able to get away with so many crimes for so such a long period of time was completely within the realm of possibility. And it was only, it was in the, uh, like late seventies to the early eighties. Well, actually, no, it's like through the seventies. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mine Hunter starts with, I believe, in the sixties, but that was when they first began. To, like, it, it was a couple decade long process though, and that's why that's why there was like a couple decades of serial killers, and it's so rare to hear about a serial killer being caught now. But serial killers are still being but, caught. I've talked about many shows. It's because of law enforcement procedures have changed. So, no, I totally buy that he was doing the shit before and he just wasn't caught. And that was something that um, Romero may have had. And I get that. But I also I I would also like and I wouldn't say necessarily argue, but like I I would say that, like, you know, like no argue to go for it to take on the other side of it is like it's like they also kind of feel like childish murder fantasies. Yeah, they they do, but in man, they do. But then a lot of people, like when you hear that, like what killers recount of what they feel when they kill people, it's it's a lot like that. Yeah. Well, but I think that that's where the flashback scenes come in because, like, when he first breaks into the car, in the train car, yeah, when he goes to open the door in the flashback. She's waiting for him in like a flowing gown. Yes, like, she, oh, you're she's here. Ready, she's ready to seduce him. She's ready yeah. to seduce him, and then but that then, rea- and then that. Uh, reality, I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah, that, that he, delusion goes away. Reality comes in. He like awkwardly like stabs her with a needle, and it takes way too long for her to go like <laughs> knocked Forever. out. He's like, you're just gonna go to sleep, and she's even like, you're one of those freaky rapists, aren't you? Yeah, you know? that, that's, and I, that's why I thought that they were gonna they weren't being murdered. And I'm like, oh, he's just knocking them out and then like drinking some blood and leaving it. I'm like, ah, that's more like she's getting back up actually. No, like, no, no. He's, <laughs> I, I am convinced what happened in that re- movie's reality is he, he killed her in stage of suicide is yeah. what went on. Well, and so I wouldn't have bringing their blood though, but he said it, he sedated them. Wouldn't he end up sedating himself by drinking? Wouldn't it be in her bloodstream still? Oh, I mean, that would just also be like doing drugs though. That I don't know kill if you, you can. Well, but I mean, like, can you get a? I don't. I don't know. Can you inject? A, like, if someone shoots up heroin, can you yeah. get high off of their blood by injecting that into yourself? Then. Well, in theory, <laughs> the Mike's like, you, like I have it, an idea. Yeah, I never thought. <laughs> no, 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 no I'm like, no, this is this is actually a thing that like lots of people have explored. Like, like in theory, it could. Let's say for the sake of okay, first off, if you're just a normal human being, no, you're not gonna get high off of it. What happens if you drink human blood? You're gonna get goddamn fucking sick off of it. That's oh, what's yeah. gonna happen. You're just gonna get sick. You're not gonna get high. You're just gonna get sick. Now, let's say in theory you're something that can subsist off of human blood. That human blood is gonna have a proportion. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it got distributed through of whatever that intoxicant is. Though you have to keep in mind that you're not drinking. I'm working on the assumption you're not the entirety of the corpse's amount of right, blood. Right. Now, so you're not getting that exact on. injection. You're only getting a portion of it. And so, like, yes, heroin is a very dangerous drug. And let's just say that you had 
there is no portions of heroin that a human being could put on their tongue and would have no effect to, th- to them just because like that's it, it's when it gets into proportions um the, <laughs> this is shit i think about this is shit i listen to other people think about <laughs> but um um, but when it comes down to it, if you're going to start drinking the blood of a human corpse that like injected heroin or got like some drugs in their system, in reality, in the real world, real world scenarios, what's going to happen is you're going to get horribly, violently ill from drinking human blood. Your body will not, it will not go well for you. Yeah. I encourage everyone in the audience not to drink human blood. <laughs> Or at least or in small amounts. I find matter. a teaspoon of child's blood really helps me kick an illness now and then. But We don't mind. need to do another Pizzagate episode. We've already done one of them. <laughs> um, okay, so I feel like I, I still have uh, more here. Or where, 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 where did we leave off there? I felt like we got horribly derailed there for a we moment. We got horribly derailed, but that's okay. Let's... I brought up Richard Chase. That's what got like everything horribly yeah. derailed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, what do you got next? I, I think we can, we can move oh, along. Oh, yes. Was, I, I think it would be a great thing. Uh, talk about, was, um, why George Romero views us as, uh, his favorite. uh, one of his like most emotional movies. Now I don't have really specific details on it. And yeah, favorite movies, as Mike said. Um, but the original cut of this was apparently, um, George Romero's director's cut that he wanted to have out was, uh, over three hours long. Oh, I, I read two hours and 45, so almost three. But, like, I mean, this is Wikipedia, so who knows? But That's a long fucking cut. The yeah, movie I have, feels long, I, and it's only an hour yes. and a half. <laughs> I have, um, oh, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry. No, Lucas is correct. I'm sorry, Lucas is correct. I did the math wrong. Would you say it was, Lucas? Uh, 2.45. Uh, Lucas is correct. Two hours and 45 minutes. I'm sorry, I did the math wrong. Um, I'm not very good at math, everyone. I know it's come up before, but Lucas is correct on this one. So two hours and 45 minutes. And yeah. that was um, not – we're not talking a work print cut. Um, we're not talking about a thing that, like, was intended to be edited down. It is what George Romero intended to be his final cut of the And he the wanted movie. it all in black and white, correct? This, yeah, this is also it. correct. And I quick side note – the orig- the two hour and forty five minute um reels of it were actually discovered in twenty twenty one and they're apparently went to private auction and it's one of those things that I actually cannot determine if this is real or not. It got reported on lots of um media websites and outlets that are normally pretty valid however since then nobody has seemed to turn up anything about this at all even what the auction may have been so i also personally have my doubts if this was actually real or not however it's just because currently rumored the expense of getting another film print mastered would be so crippling because they were talking about how they made the movie for like no money to yeah. begin with. Oh, I that, that's actually it. that's actually the story I want to finish on for the episode. So hold hold that, Mike. Okay. Hold that. That's the story I got that I want to finish on. That I think you're gonna love love some details I have for it. But um, continue, please. Just don't uh, spoil too much of that. Yeah. So, well, no, I'm just saying, like, from a filmmaking standpoint, like, it would cost a lot of money to have multiple prints struck like that. Mm-hmm. So, unless it was a distribution, I'm not sure who put it out originally, but Dawn of the Dead got released in his original cut that he wanted, and that was just completely independent. So, unless it was a distributor thing, and it wouldn't have been cut for content, it would have just been for pacing, I'm sure. But uh, also, if a private collector would have bought it, they would have done something with it because they would have recouped the money that they probably inevitably spent on it. And like, why would you hoard that and then not release it? You'd want people to see it, I would imagine. Yeah. Or whoever originally had it and found it would have sold it to a company or licensed it 
rather than sell it privately. That doesn't make any sense. This is why you're 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 making all the right logical connections. Why I have a strong suspicion that this actually never happened. That not in terms of the original cut, but in terms of it being found. Yeah, I have sure. extreme doubts of it ever ever being found. Now, in regards to what the original cut was. I tried looking up things about what was included in it and people that worked on the movie and people that saw the original uh, two hour and 45 minute cut all describe dialogue sequences. And so I think this movie was meant to be much more a meditation of being in a dying uh, Rust Belt town. Yeah, that makes sense. I, also, where, I felt like. Savini's character like that was very trimmed down it felt like almost yeah. like an afterthought like he's like why am I staying here I should leave and then Kuda is like no you need to stay here and sip and keep in the business like it it felt like there was a whole other subplot there that was taken out it did, it did. and then with, with the cousin leaving as well and he said you know people only leave when they want to forget where they're from and like that was really poignant, but I'm like, it feels like it's kind of empty because there's not really much about that in the movie. I feel like that's probably what it was. Right. One thing like, I yeah, found... Like, the focal sorry, point ahead, on, on the cut that I'm assuming we all saw was... I mean, it was all about Martin. Like, we, we saw, like, there was... Yeah, like, there was, like, yeah. little hints of this other stuff, but it wasn't fleshed out at all. Also, the, the, the warehouse scene... Like with the shootout and stuff like that really comes out of fucking nowhere. Like I'm wondering oh, yeah. if like a whole subplot with like whatever was going on in there, like that felt that's very right. out of place. Yeah, that's right. The police are chasing Martin, and then all of a sudden, like a bunch of other people. We never even mentioned that that happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like we've made it this far, and we have not even mentioned that that there was that whole yeah. shootout. <laughs> The random yeah. giant action scene, like ten minutes before the movie ends, that doesn't actually factor into anything. In the movie. No, no, has like, a, a, like correct me if I'm wrong. It doesn't seem like it has anything to do with anything. And it no, just, like, again, happens. there's no repercussions right. to it. No one mentions it, so it's like either this extended cut has all of like the newspaper articles about a dead body being found, or two cops being brutally slain, and like a whole like shootout in the middle of town. But, like, it's just like, no, nah, we're just not going to talk about it. It's a small little town, so I feel like that would be, like, giant news. Yes. So one thing it's I like American Psycho, where, like, the whole action thing where he, like, shoots out with the cops, it just didn't happen. It was all a fantasy. Yeah. So, so one thing I find very striking is that when I was researching about this um, director's cut, which may or may not exist um, now nowadays, uh is that uh, people who worked on the movie and people who saw it, all the things that they mentioned that they were missing, they never mention anything to do with vampire scenes. So everything, I'm very much very convinced, because if there was like other vampire scenes, if there was other shit like that, I guarantee you people would have been talking about that. Um, but they, they only talk about... Um, character um uh character subplots and the other characters in braddock pennsylvania and um i actually i actually spent a while living near braddock pennsylvania i just want to qu quick share this just a little fun fact um movie takes place in braddock pennsylvania it's a um just right outside of Pitt pittsburgh uh almost all the filming was done in Bra braddock pennsylvania um, if you remotely pay attention to politics, which anybody that listens to the show, show knows I'm an avid politics nerd and I'm not going to go into any sort of rants or anything, but John Featherman got his career starting being a mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. And I actually lived oh, in shit. Pittsburgh when John Fetterman got elected mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. So all that shit all weirdly ties together. Um Thank you. Just quick side note, that I thought it was that's just some interesting trivia. That's just some interesting trivia I had that I just wanted to drop. But going back to it, like I think um Braddock is someone from Pennsylvania in that area, it's a interesting place in that it's been struggling and dying for a long time. And people since, keep trying to since, bring it back. Since before this movie was made. <laughs> since well, before one, this movie was made. The one thing and, that I did hear on the one interview on the disc that I got to watch earlier was 
I think John Amplis made a comment about, I think George really got a kick out of the idea of a big corporation sucking the blood out of a small town mm-hmm. and like using that as a metaphor or something. And I was, cause this, the, it was a mill town and it died or whatever. And I was like, okay, yeah. I think that's probably what the movie really was about, but they trimmed it down. And like you said, all the vampire stuff is the, is the money shot shit. So they put all that in and then cut all the rest because they also, the part that, I, I want to also quick terms. interject as a, also a metaphor. I was trying to get in earlier, and I don't want this to be missed, is with the vampirism, it's a kind of ingenious metaphor with the injecting with the needle as a substitution for the teeth, yeah. then like yeah. like slicing open, and like and Dracula, um, all previous vampirism stuff has kind of had a weird sexual element and having in this like date rape element to it is a kind of ingenious way to up- update the uh, yeah. vampiric myths, which this was like post <laughs> I Am <laughs> Legend. Well, like, one of my uh... I Am Legend at the same time, at the exact same time as Interview with the Vampire. Well, one of my notes I, I made and I was kind of like joking with myself, but only half joking i guess like i was like i was like if they made if they remade this today they would like really hammer home that he's an incel you know oh absolutely oh (laughs) yeah oh actually that'd be a great way to remake this movie he wouldn't fall into a radio show host he'd be on a message board yes no no no, dude no dude he would be calling in to like oh oh dude you have i'm like i'm like something super in the like crazy (laughs) politics shit there are those like right-wing youtube shows he'd be calling in to like fucking tim pool or he'd be calling in to uh yeah Yeah, just some Uh, random person uh, alex jones he'd be calling to alex jones no no he'd be calling to alex jones about how he's one of the energy vampires and they got it all wrong about what energy vampires are yeah Yeah, but there was it was interesting too. Dear that, God, whoever in Hollywood is listening, get a hold of Lucas and I. This is yet yeah, another brilliant movie idea we put. This is an <laughs> ongoing joke on the show, Mike. Well, not a joke. It's Lucas and I actually hoping to like get jobs or make money one day, and no one's called us yet. But we've got oh. so many good movie ideas. Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, anyone listening? Call give any us, of us. Yeah, We're cheap. We'll sell out real cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm sorry, the, continue. One of the things I think that they definitely trimmed out that I wanted to see more of was he's talking yeah. about how, and that synopsis said he tries to only kill, like, low lives and thugs. He says it's hard to pick a victim. I watch what they do, and I know, but I decided to leave them alone. Like, he's following that crazy woman that's yeah. really a bitch to him, and it's like they're obviously, like, a whole other subplot where he, like, whatever bad, like, dark secrets these town people have... Just like the the woman he's sleeping with, she's cheating on her husband. The other woman was cheating on her husband. Like all this shit's going on in the town that he would have been aware of when he's just walking around doing stuff. And I feel like they didn't really go anywhere with that. So I think that's probably a lot of what the movie would have been is maybe like he's selecting his victims based on that sort of shit. And and that falls into like a very much a Christian. Uh, Judeo-Christian mor- morality, which yeah. also we see with the the family member character that's really like yes. harping on that, yes. and so and also like I, I can say as being like someone from Pittsburgh, like Catholicism and that religious more. Um, well, I shouldn't say from. Spent some time living there. Um, Catholicism and religious morality, and I was there in the early two thousands. Was a, still a big and, fucking thing that and it would be an interesting god knows what it was like in the 70s it would be an interesting juxtaposition to have like you know martin's character being abused by his like ultra religious uncle or cousin or whoever um and then him st- but him still choosing his victim based on those kind of on the morality Christian values yeah. like that'd be interesting okay so what is the relation between him and uh kuda um, so, are they cousins? Or are is, they I, uncle? Is 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 he correct in the age? I it's cousin, cousin but like he's me. so much older. I I just want to say uncle. Like I, I know. I yeah, know that's how it felt. It's a weird cousin scenario. I feel like Kud is probably his last living relative that yeah. he could get taken in by. Is what I the implication was to me. Yeah. But that implies that something happened in the past that he was so, either institutionalized or something that he needed to be cared okay. for. 
so so here's what Wik- Wikipedia says that his mom commits suicide. I did not get that anywhere. Is oh, there no, the, is there a the, novelization of this movie anywhere? Yes, so there is, is in based, fact. It's Actually, probably based on yes, the screenplay. Maybe that's where we can get the answers to all. Yes, this in stuff. fact, okay. in the um, in fact, um, here, um, I actually have it pulled up somewhere. It was is another one of my little factoids. Um, there is in fact a uh, novelization. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know who uh, wrote wrote it, but the original script included a lot of voiceover narration from Martin narrating uh like other characters and the scenes and the novelization includes that voiceover from the script so that's a fun fact of something that exists out there um i i'll be honest i didn't look into it any more than that so i don't know um how easy any information is to find about it that's probably where like the synopsis and shit comes from, though, is because the usually novelizations are based on original screenplay drafts. So, I, I, I will uh, say we've run into this before. I disregard a lot of the Wikipedia plot synopsis because Lucas, how many fucking episodes have we done that you you were looking at the Wikipedia happen. plot synopsis? So it's like <laughs> it's just wrong. Yeah, like that um, didn't happen. So, uh, Susanna Sparrow is the, uh, is the author of the novelization, in case oh, anybody that's, is um, curious. So that's, Thank you. Uh, yeah, she wrote the Dawn of the Dead novelization with Romero. I think oh, that was the first wife. Oh, oh no, oh, shit! Okay. Oh, no, okay. shit! That Thank you! Sense. This is great! This is great why we're all in here together. Yeah, because cool. I have an original first draft, or first oh, edition oh, of hell yeah. Dawn of the Dead. Hell yeah. Dude, oh, my God! Just, edition <laughs> for everyone listening uh might just pull it down off a shelf right above his computer that's just a spur of the moment thing yeah. it's all synchronicity my, my original right there. first edition hardback of that my little brother found it at a flea market he called me he's like hey do you have the dawn of the dead book and i'm like where are you and he's like, I'm friend, like, take five steps to the left he's like why am i like, just do it and i'm like what do you describe it is it orange he's like yeah and i'm like how much is it and he's like hold on to ask i'm like oh just ask him if it's like a quarter. Like I was like, you gotta play this real cool. He's like, why? So he finally he ended up buying the book, and he's like, why? And I sent him a link to eBay. He's like, holy shit! I'm like, yes. <laughs> it's like a so, four hundred dollar um, book. What he find. Holy shit! Got it for a dollar. I, I still have a couple more things that I really want to bring up with us in this discussion. I learned about this movie, but to go back over like the why this is George Romero's favorite movie, and we're going over that there is a two hour and forty five minute cut of this movie, and that there was also like a lot of voiceover narrative that was um, deleted from this movie that appears in the novelization that. I feel it's a very safe bet to say that uh, George Romero originally intended this movie to be kind of a much longer dramatic experimental movie of kind of expressing uh, the feelings of being in a dying Midwestern town. And I still think it shows through at points in the movie. And, but I think from what I can gather of, what the missing footage <clears throat> is about, what the um, other ways that this movie was translated as a novelization, what it included was voiceovers. Nobody's talking about extra death scenes. It's voiceovers. Oh. It's other character scenes. That's what everyone's talking about. And so I think that that was meant to be much more uh, the focus. And so I, th- I, I think... That's why he views it low key as his favorite movie is because he also viewed of he could still see what that statement was. He could still see the movie that didn't happen. Well, he's yeah. His whole thing, it's all social. If that was the if the original cut of the movie was more about that, it's all social politics, which is his absolute yes. jam. Yeah. Oh, like because yeah. I actually was watching, I'm like, this feels weird, especially like post the crazies. Because it's not, like, big and full of action and stuff. And I'm like, this feels more like what I imagine Jack's wife and the, there's always Vanilla to be more like. It's like, these are just, like, social dramas. That it's have, actually very uh, similar to Season of the Witch. 
Um, you mentioned you haven't seen Season of the Witch yet. It's very similar to Season of the Witch. It's both kind it's of like have the that. other side of the coin, right? Because Season of the Witch yeah. is the female. Yes, they're, I guess they're actually yeah, very is, much related. Yeah. You're correct, Lucas. Yeah. yeah, Season of the Witch is very female focused, and this is very male focused, and how society is failing both, and everything is just moving on and past, and everyone's losing. And it's funny t- saying that, and we're in 2023, and I'm going to do the fucking hack. Oh, oh, my God, we're in 2024. You're right. I'm going to do that fucking hack thing and say, like, oh, it's still relevant. God damn it, all. <laughs> Dude, I did, the, I did the hack thing. I said the hack thing. Look, um, but no, but go, no, going back, that's, 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 that's why I feel like um, Romero feels really strongly about this movie is it does seem to be a very – personal statement film when you kind of start filling in those missing pieces and admittedly i'm it could be completely different but i'm trying to do my best guessing from the information i could gather and i think i have a very educated guess over to what the missing material is and what the movie thematically was supposed to look like and this was supposed to be a meditation on being in a dying rust belt town yeah, no, I agree. Okay, so related to that, let's shift into here. And this is also like, this is where we get into the f- fun thing that I know you're going to fucking love. This I got a great detail here, Mike, that you're going to fucking love. Um, we're going to shift into that. So how did it turn into the movie that we saw? Is that George Romero got hooked up with, oh, God damn it. I got to pull up my screen right here. He got hooked up with River, the... River, River, River. Produce. I, w- I really want to make sure I get the name right. Is it Richard Rubenstein? I'm... Yes, Rubenstein. Richard yeah. Rubenstein. That's a fucking prick. He's the reason that Dawn of the Dead never got an American Blu-ray release. I know. I know. We yeah. we can get into we can get into that as well. But however, um, he was the one that kind of wanted to make things get give Romero more money. <clears throat> it also kind of make things more commercial Commercial, and this was the last project so romero had had two failures with the crazies and season of the witch before this he had the big success of night of the living dead then he had the failures of um actually multiple i'm sorry multiple failures um there's always vanilla which actually no that one barely counts that there are some weird funny things that but Really, his big ones were Night of the Living Dead, Season of Witch, and The Crazies. And Season of Witch and The Crazies actually failed. It's crazy to me that The Crazies failed. <laughs> That's a great but fucking movie. I I, I, like I, I I really like The Crazies. Um, that's time. a movie I rewatch every now and then, and I'm kind of amazed at how much I still enjoy it. I think it holds up super well. I rewatched it like right after the pandemic, and I was just like, well, that was the thing. Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so he failed, um, and uh, I'm sorry, Mike, you know, uh, Richard Rubenstein? Ruben, Rubenstein. Rubenstein, Richard Rubenstein. Uh, he helped essentially Romero finish funding with uh, Martin, also helped get it to kind of a edited state that they could get distribution, and then the two of them worked together for Dawn of the Dead. Which mm-hmm. Mike also brought up uh, the issue that we have talked about before, Lucas, as well, we have. over we have. that copyright bullshit making Donna Dead virtually impossible to find in any sort of legal means these days. Yep. Yep. You can watch it on the Internet Archive or YouTube, but that's about it. Oh, if, you got, if you got a multi region Blu ray player, Second Sight put out a gorgeous box set of it. Oh. That's good to know. I, I have the I have the, it's, it's the ultimate edition that Anchor Bay put out, but it has this all the, three yeah, soundtracks. See, so I have the Anchor Bay one, yeah. The book, it's it's this thick. It it was it's fucking great. It's out of print now, but it man, it's it's great. They put it out in 4K as well, but that's only for this region two. So region B. The little detail that I found, which I actually really fucking loved, regardless of what you, what you think of Ruben Ruben Stein. Steen. Steen. God damn it. I'm not going to get this right. Rubenstein. Um, regardless of what you think of Rubenstein, the, 
detail that I found out that I thought was fucking awesome. And I think like any independent artist, like we all got to hustle. We all like, we all got to do it in the, in being artists. I thought this was so cool and interesting is that the movie was essentially filmed for a budget of roughly around $100,000. However, when they were going to dis- distributors and they were selling the movie and also leveraging it for next film projects, they said the budget was two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars because they did not want any potential investors or specifically future investors to think that they could make a movie that well yep. that cheaply. And Absolutely. so they and so it's like, well, that last movie you really made. You you really like that cost us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now we need half a million dollars. When in reality, they're just lying. I've actually talked about it before on the show. Being quite frank, as somebody like working in the industry, being independent artist, being a liar, being a huckster is sometimes a very un- underrated skill set. And Absolutely. there is some serious lessons to be taken from that. Despite how you may not like other things they did, sometimes they got some good um some good tricks. And like I always like to say, like the big mega con- mega corporations, all the systems and powers that be are doing nothing but holding all of us back. It's all right that we bend the truth every now and then to help yeah. at least bend things in our fa- favor so i love this hucksterism reminds me of some bartman bailey shit i love that shit as well yeah when we were uh when we were trying to sell white doomsday um with keen had a sales agent and they were telling distributors that it cost like the movie actually cost ten thousand dollars to make they were talking people was like oh it was 50 or 60 grand because no one will even look at a movie if they think it costs that less they're like oh right well, this is probably shit. Or they're like, oh, yeah, you could do it for that, so you don't need a lot of money. So then they're like, oh, yeah, they can recoup this easy if we we lowball them. So they, that was one of the things that I learned from that, too. It's like, don't don't be honest until it's sold. Then you can say whatever you want. <laughs> See, this is, what, this is why I was looking – I was holding off – towards the end with this and i like was looking forward to talking to you about this of like you have direct experience with what they're talking about with the funding and distribution of the yeah. movie here yep and then from this working is... oh, from working at target i learned that um so i was one of the managers that if when they cut our payroll if we still made all of our deadlines for fulfillment and shit with less payroll, then the next round would be even less. They're like, oh, well, you can do it. So why are we giving you, why would we give you extra payroll? It's like, no, you actually have to fail. Or they'll just keep trimming it down to see how how deep they can cut it to save money and fuck you. So it's it's yeah. it's shitty, but it's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, man this is cool like because like you know this here we are this is it's almost been a year now but like when you and i were talking at scares that care in uh wesley southard's room about romero and i was just like i've got to get mike on our show because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah you know i just you went in remember on, that night too actually yeah yeah um uh so this was no this, i mean this is like exactly what i hoped for um <laughs> Um, Why are you talking like you're shutting it down? I still have I still have more things to bring. You got up. more stuff? I thought I do. See, I thought you were shutting down. I, no. <laughs> see, okay, all right. What do you got? Um, uh, okay. Uh, next thing. Okay, I got. I, get, I just got this little fun trivia, which I literally had no idea about. Is that in European countries, this movie, um, Martin was re-edited by Dario Argento. And all the scenes were done in chronological order. So all the dream flashback sequences were actually all the opening of the movie. Uh, Uh, Goblin did the soundtrack and it was called Race for It Vampire. Yeah, Argento, when he, because he was a producer on Dawn (laughs) of the Dead, recut. Yep. He recut Dawn with a whole Goblin score. He trimmed out all of the comedy 
It's, it's an awful cut. I actually hate the the Argento cut of the movie. It's really bad. I've actually never seen the Argento cut, to be 100% honest. I've only ever watched the um, the um, theatrical cut and uh, director's American director's cut. Well, so what's interesting about that, too, as a side note, is that the director's cut is not actually a director's cut. The director's cut was basically like a, the the full pre-trimmed down version. That was just like a rough cut. The director's yeah. cut is a theatrical cut because it was unrated. That's the version that yeah. Romero wanted, and that's the best version is just the theatrical, so which good. normally is not the case. I I agree with you on that. I agree with you that the theatrical is the best. Yeah, because the, the director's cut, or whatever they call it, the extended cut, is so wonky with the pacing, it does mm-hmm. not work at all. And Argento's cut is just shit. It's it's really it's bad. It's weird, not, dude. It's like, it, it's like a 90-minute American action movie. Like, yeah, or it's, something. it's like, not it's great. really bizarre. I've only watched it twice, and I'm just like, I can't fucking do this. I'm not an Argento fan. So I am, but, like, I still... I didn't think his I'm in the mi- I'm in the felt, middle. I yeah. like some of Argento and I don't like some of Argento. I'm right I don't in between think his you two. of it felt like an Argento film. It felt No, it I doesn't. Don't know. It, felt it felt weird. weird. It felt like they yeah. were pandering. They just trimmed out the yeah. I like some Argento. Arge- or, uh, not to get too off topic, but opera I fucking love. Demons uh, I love. Yeah. Really opera bad, opera but... Demons fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. So there's some things that I like, but I just bought Trauma off of the Vinegar Syndrome sale, so I'm excited to see that finally, because Savini did the effects for it. I always wanted to watch that. Oh, that's a perfect segue. This is my final piece of trivia. This is my final thing I have to bring up, is that Martin is the first movie that Tom Savini and George Romero officially worked on together. He was supposed to do Night of the Living Dead, but he he went into Vietnam, so he wasn't able to work on it. So um, we, we like we talk about things frequently on this show. Um, I, I gotta say I have weird personal connections to Tom Savini because, like I said, I live in Pittsburgh, and they say I lived in Pittsburgh. I actually lived on the same block as Tom Savini. Really? I ran into Tom Savini just like going out. So right at the end of of my street was this great little um, coffee shop, uh, cult video store. It was uh, like, like keep in mind it's early early mid 2000s and uh dvd rental stores at least in big cities could still exist and it was this cult video place and i'd go in there for coffee frequently and rent movies and uh shit and i'd run into tom savini there and what i mean by run into him i never talked to him i would just see him being there yelling at <laughs> yelling at the baristas and yelling at all the people working there and he'd just be a total ass everyone. I've met him a few times at conventions. Every time I met Tom Savini he has been a goddamn fucking asshole. And I have feel no shame saying this and this is no controversy. Because if you just that's... look up online anywhere yeah, about yeah. people that aren't nice at conventions or people <laughs> you you feel like let you down meeting them at the conventions tom savini is at the goddamn fucking when i top when list. i met him i was actually starstruck because i couldn't he was my idol george him and george romero were two of my biggest influences in my life like when so I you're gonna have kid, to tell us your story students. about meeting george romero oh yeah i'll do it in that time well, yeah yeah but savini, go first here. i met him at horror find weekend back in i think it was 2006 or 7 and I had my copy of Day of the Dead and my Dawn of the Dead. I was so fucking nervous. I, I, I was, first off, I was there that weekend. <laughs> There's actually a bunch of people I've talked to over the years. Like, I was at that show and I'm like, fuck, I no. probably met you like long before I knew who. No, no, no. I, I guarantee you we never crossed paths. I guarantee you. I, I went with a whole crew of people from Pittsburgh and we were all hanging out in the parking lot getting super stoned and drinking liquor and beer the whole time and we kept trying to make friends with people and no one would be friends with us and no one would come back with us to tr- smoke we I- i'm serious i'm a hundred percent goddamn serious I believe you. we didn't make any friends i tried getting um carl to Malik to come back and smoke weed and drink liquor with us he wouldn't do it i tried getting brian Keane to do it he wouldn't do it think about years later i'd be working with these people yeah <laughs> this is also the same weekend that i first met tom savini before a couple years later, we lived on the same street, um, in the same block, and I met him at the convention, and he was a fucking dick to me. For the record, I did not ask him to smoke weed or drink liquor with me. I just tried being like, yo, dude, I love your shit. And he was like, Ugh. 
I'm like, yeah, I, sorry, go I, ahead, I, go ahead. I walked up and I was like starstruck and I couldn't even speak. I was so, which is weird because I never shut the fuck up. Yeah. I didn't know what to say. So I like literally walked up and was like, uh, uh, and I couldn't talk. And he just looks up and he's like, do you want me to sign this stuff or not? And oh. it just, and I just like oh. shattered. My friends were there. Oh. Off the side, and I'm like, uh, yeah, thanks. And I got on the side myself, and I walked away. And my one buddy is like, dude, I'm sorry. Like immediately, he just said that he yeah. knew. I was devastated. I'm like, wow, I didn't oh, want to believe damn. the stories, but it was true. And then I met him again later, and I talked to him a little bit. The trick is you got to ask him about acting because he's he doesn't want to talk about special effects, which is fair. I get that. You know, it's it gets annoying after a while, but. I learned, because I had friends that went to his school, because I also, out of high school, I was going to go to Tom Speedy's special effects program. Everyone's like, don't fucking do it. All he he did, he's had, he has, uh, sorry, other people teach the class for him, and then he shows up, like, once or twice a week to do coke and hit on the chicks. And that's it. <laughs> and I was uh, like, wow, that's awful. And then that's... I found out at conventions, if you've got drugs or tits, then he will talk to you. Oh Funny God. enough, I didn't offer him drugs, and uh, he had no interest in me. Um, like I said, I watched him yell at baristas in um, in Pittsburgh on the same sh- – like, like I, if you ever look up the um, – you can look up a video online on YouTube of a tour of uh, Tom Savini's house or uh, – uh, his, his his house in Portland, it's literally on the same block I used to live on. I lived on that same block. It's crazy. It was crazy me watching that video. Did you guys ever read his uh, his autobiography? No, no, I couldn't it, because it I've I've, I, I, I've seen him be too much. Thing of a I've ever read in my life. It's he the most talks what? about like losing his virginity. It's it's so fucking awkward. There's so much, so many personal sex stories, like graphic sex stories in that book of him fucking fans and stuff. And he refers to his dick as Little Jason. And it's like, so it's a mongoloid? <laughs> like, what oh, is, my like, God. What exactly? so, I, so, it's, it's so uncomfortable. And I'm like, dude, someone needed to have edited this. They just slapped the, his hand off the keyboard like, no, stop. No more, and if, Tom. And if people think listening to this that uh, Mike or myself are telling stories that are like – completely insane or like completely revealing no just do a search online it's not nice. true at all there is shit ton of documentation about this and this is one of the things that like like we don't shy away from on this show is talking about who the people are who the people create this shit are and in this case i actually have a personal connection i've actually like seen this person many times however i would love to shift gears shift gears not shift gears shift gears and mike you're the only one of the three of us that actually got to meet george romero and i don't know what the situation is but can you just please tell us about that yes if you guys want to smell my hands afterwards um, (laughs) um so just for the record too I absolutely adore Tom Savini still. A huge fan. Man's been a giant influence on me, despite all Amazing the shit. Amazing artist. Amazing artist. Yeah. Not not degrading his artistic great, accomplishments. Great director, in, great anyway. actor, everything. But anyway, so Romero, complete yes. polar opposite of Savini. Super fucking nice guy. I was at, um, so back in 2000. Eight, seven, eight, when Diary of the Dead came out, or when it was announced, they had a MySpace contest where if you did, like, a little parody video of Diary of the Dead, which all we knew about at the time was that it was, like, a a fake documentary or something. Like, that's all we knew. You could, potentially, the prize was you would get put on the Diary of the Dead DVD. So we made a short film called Demonstration of the Dead, which is, we had Brian Keane cameo, and that's how... The first time I hung out with Brian outside of a book sign. Um, so that was a super huge deal for me. So we did this contest. We did our little thing. It was a fake, it was a little fake news broadcast about zombie rights activists and shit. I'm like, okay, it's like political. Romero's going to fucking love this because he was supposed to be the judge. We had, um, we had the fucking people chanting, hey, hey, George A., how many undead have you killed today? So <laughs> the Vietnam, Vietnam that's thing and shit. We had yeah, that's, that's great. Shit. So we had this whole thing. We had um, NALI, which is the NAALI. It was the National Association for the Advancement of the Living Impaired. And 
we did fake propaganda pamphlets for it of like talking about how they're going to sue George Romero for defamation of character and like all this shit. So when I met him, we, we, so we didn't win the contest. They took the top five entries and put them on the DVD. We made number six and we oh, lost the pen and teller. Damn. And that I pissed mean, me oh, off. Oh, I, I gotta be honest. I know the short film that you lost the pen and teller. It's great. It's yeah, great. Pen and teller is fucking hilarious. Pen like, teller is so good. Do you guys yeah. really need to be for, on the fucking DVD? Of, like, is this going to help your career? Like, come on. But it's a um, fucking great short. I love it. I, I didn't know it was on the DVD. I saw it because it's on YouTube, and I agree with you on that. It, like, they did not need any help. No, and I'm a pen and teller super fan. They did indie filmmaking contest. Like, no. But, so anyway, so we, we did all this. So I was like, I went and I got, actually, I have my, my demonstration of the dead poster that we did. I got George Merritt to sign that. So I was at Horror Find was the premiere and we did like a fake zombie rights protest rally like live. We had picket signs and we had zombies on leashes. We did the whole fucking Barnum Bailey thing. So I finally got to meet George Romero because like I was so scared the whole weekend and he had a giant line the whole time. Randomly that Sunday there was just weirdly nobody was Wait, at the con. Was, was George like, Romero there that weekend? Two thousand six. It was two thousand. Wait, no, it had to have been. Maybe it was oh eight. I was at I was at that one makes, I was yeah. at the three horror finds prior, so I I was only at the 06 one and I know George Mara wasn't there. That's that's what just at least I thought he wasn't there cuz No, he, he would have been the headliner cuz it was Yeah. It was um it was Bruce Campbell at 06. Yeah, because I declared, he had a line outside the fucking building. I didn't get to meet him. I never met him because his lines always crazy. So, it was oh I think it was 08 was when I met George Mara. Oh no, it was 09. Okay. It was 09. Because there was a documentary crew filming me then. It was 2009. And that's when I was that's when I was already living in Portland, so I stopped yeah. going to horror finds. So it was it was 2009. So Sunday at cons is usually like a dead day. So for whatever yeah. reason, there was nobody at George Romero's table like at all. He's just sitting there like literally like twiddling his thumbs, and I'm like, are you fucking serious? So I'm like, all right, it's now or never, and I'm like. All right, let's do it. And I'm like terrified. And I walk up and I start <laughs> rambling. I'm like, he's like, oh, hi, I'm George. I'm like, hi, I'm like, I saw Dawn of the Dead at Too Young of Age. And he's like, uh, and I'm like, let me take a breath and say that again. And I'm like, I saw Dawn of the Dead when I was like eight years old and it changed my life and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, man, that's wild. <laughs> like, that's, he talks like an old hippie. And I fucking, yeah. I loved it. He was like, man, that's wild stuff, man. And uh, so we started talking and I'm like, I was like, you know, I'd love you to sign this. And I'm like, if you don't mind. And I had him sign my demonstration of the dead poster as well. And I'm like, I did this for the diary of the dead contest. You know, we made sixth place, but you know, I really, you know, I just, it was an honor knowing that you saw it. And he looked at me, he's like, I gotta be honest, man. I didn't see any of them. They didn't show them to me. He's like, I was supposed to, and they picked the winners. And he's like, I thought it was kind of dumb. And I'm like, Oh, oh shit. So he, like, told me all that, and then I'm like, oh, well, let me pitch the movie to you. So I gave yeah. him a burned copy on DVD, which I'm sure he threw right in the trash. <laughs> but I showed him the pan the propaganda pamphlet. It's got, like, a zombie hand shaking a regular hand and stuff. And, like, nice. the whole thing is a picture of him in there. He laughed his ass off. He's like, this is great. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, we did all this crap, whatever. He signed it. And then we ta I said, I'm like, so when are you going to make another movie like Bruiser? And he just, like, looked at me, and he's like... Thank you for saying that. I'm like, I thought it was a great movie. And he's like, so did I, but nobody else did. He's like, I really want to make other stuff that's not dead related. He's like, I love the zombies, but like, I've got all these other ideas, but nobody, nobody wants to fund them. And I'm like, that sucks, dude. And like, we talked yeah. for like seven, eight minutes. And then people started coming into the room and they're like, starting to get in line behind me. And I'm like, all right. But it was so nice. And I literally, my knees were weak from talking to I him. Bet. And then many years later when we were, um, we were about to finish up on Dreaming of White Doomsday. We were pulling a three-day straight editing session to try to get it done in time for the world premiere. And the morning that we finished the movie, I woke up, like, I slept for, like, two hours. And I get up, and I'm like, all right, let's finish this fucking movie. My first feature, right? I get a phone call from Brian Keane. He's like, George Romero just passed away. And I was like, are you fucking kidding? I was just, everyone that day, the entire crew that was working on this movie... Everyone was just in the shits all fucking day. We're finishing this movie, and I'm like, this is supposed to be, like, the happiest day of my life, and I'm so fucking depressed. 
and it was awful. So I was like, well, that sucks. And that was the that's the end of my George Romero stories. <laughs> but lovely man. Very happy I got to meet. Oh, actually, there's one weird little side note. I probably shouldn't even say this, but fuck it. Um, let's hear it. Let's hear it. When that happened, uh, <laughs> after he died, I got an email from a guy that I knew online, a friend of mine who uh, lives in Canada. He's an indie filmmaker that had reached out to me like years ago. He was a fan of my old stuff, and I gave him some tips, and then we've kept up over the years. So he's a really, really big fan, and he's like, "Hey, I have George Romero here at my funeral home. Cause he's a uh, he is a um oh holy shit he works uh he he at the time was like body retrieval like he would go and take the bodies from like the houses and and bring them. He wasn't a mortician, yeah. but he worked in the funeral industry. He's like." I live in, you know, wherever, and this is the the funeral home. We do a lot of celebrities here. He's like, we have George Romero here. And he's like, if you want to drive up here and pay your respects, I can, you can do that. And I was like, oh, holy shit. And I was like, uh, I mean, this is a really weird thing. I don't know what to think about this. It's like, I, do I want to see the corpse of like my favorite filmmaker? Like, is that a thing? Take it. But he's like, also... At the time, his funeral was supposed to be a private event. He's like, if you want to just come to the funeral, I can let you in the back if you just wanted to pay your respects. And then, like, a week later, it went public and people showed up in zombie costumes and stuff, which I thought was in poor taste, personally. But it was just weird. I'm like, I have the opportunity to go fucking to George Mara's funeral. I'm like, this is really weird. I didn't know what to do. I mean, it wasn't wild. weird from him. Like, I appreciated that he, he did it. But I'm just like, what a strange like opportunity and i didn't end yeah. up going i'm like i don't i don't want to go to anyone's funeral let alone I, George Romero's. I, I i don't blame you on that i i think yeah. that if i was offered the same thing like it, just think of whatever favorite creator i could think of just offer the same thing i think i'd just be like i don't okay. think i want to do that <laughs> i think i i wanted that i wanted to hang out and have a beer with them and like yeah pick their brains over the shit that they can say publicly and like, Hey, what's the real tips you got for me? I don't think I want to see their corpse though. Yeah. It's like, like when I went to Rome, I wanted to find, I wanted to go visit Fulci's grave. Like I would do that. Okay. But that's cool. Though. That's like... different. That's different because a grave is meant to be an honoring thing, yeah, regardless like, of whatever yeah. anyone thinks of like afterlife or religious beliefs, like a acceptable thing that just across human cultures, we all kind of view grave sites as being the site that we honor somebody's mm-hmm. memory yeah. at. So that makes sense to me, like traveling to somebody's uh, grave that you really respect. That makes uh, sense to me. Um, I don't want like, to viewing. Yeah, yeah, hanging out with somebody that you, like, really respect and be like, let's have a beer, and I swear to God I won't say anything publicly. Just tell me all the secret shit that I need to know. That makes sense to me. The in-between of that is, like, hanging out with the family and seeing their corpse. And I'm like, yeah. I don't think I would want to do that with no matter, like – the, it is true. Some of my like the most respected creators are some of my personal friends, and yeah. it, working the idea and like we all all three of us have that. If some of them die before us, we'll be at their funerals. But if it's a person we've never had any connection with, I yeah. um not the funeral and also not just seeing their corpse. That also seems that's, weird. And that, no, that's no, the difference. No, like okay, I however, was at, though, like JF Gonzalez's like memorial service and stuff. Like absolutely, yeah. like he was a personal friend. I would not just go to a random author's funeral that I've never met before. Like, that's too much for me. That's weird. I feel like a funeral is for the immediate family and friends. Like, I feel like that's yeah, a place same. for them, not not for me. However, but, I will say this. I think I'd go to the morgue viewing. The morgue viewing? Yes. Yes. You brought it in the funeral home. Yeah. 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 I that okay, was just. That, I don't know. It was just weird. I don't want to see. Not, I hate not, seeing dead not, bodies. Like it okay. freaks me out too much. The, okay. I. I. I am. I am. I. I've talked about it a lot on past episodes of the show. I'm into weird death things. I don't think I'd want to deal with anything with the um, emotional connection with the family. But I would be more interested in just like the uh, uh, business and just processing of. 
and like, oh, I'm being invited to see this. I'll, I'll come see this. <laughs> no, no, this is getting off on a tangent here. I'm sorry. You just got my brain working. And I'm like, you know what? There's, okay, there's part of that that I would want to see, and there's part of that I would not want to see. <laughs> okay, so um, final thing here. I, I, I got just some just very final things here. Fi- very final things. And these won't be long conversation things here. So this is great. We're talking about, like, George Romero over his entire career. And um, I did want to get kind of your viewpoints on um, uh, I'll just do it as a two part question of like, what do you think is like an underrated movie from his career? And just also, how do you feel about like how he ended his career with the final Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, Survival of the Dead? Land of the Dead was a big disappointment. It was the movie I always wanted him to be able to make, but I feel like my if it would have come out earlier than it did, then the if, I think my biggest gripe with it was the CGI and stuff. I feel like if he would have had that money to do something earlier in his career, it probably would have been better, but also by the time it came out, everyone had imitated George Romero so much that we were basically mm-hmm. watching a pastiche of himself, and it just didn't do it for me. I have not revisited that movie in many, many years. I am curious to see if it maybe I'll like it more now. I don't know. But it was also really heavy handed. I feel like um, survival Diary of the Dead has moments. Um, it's not great, but survival of the dead. He did that contractually. He didn't want to make that movie. Um, that was they said literally either you make it or someone else is going to. And we're going to put your name on it because he was obligated to do it. He had a three picture deal. Um Jesus. So that's really shitty. So that movie, you can tell his heart was not in at all. That movie was awful. That was really, really bad. Um, as far as an underrated movie by him, see, my personal favorite movie of his is probably Creep Show, um, but that's obviously not underrated. I don't think any of Romero's stuff is really. You know what, let me let me let me take back how I phrase that. It would just be not of a living. Uh, let me rephrase the question. A not living dead movie. What would you say is your favorite by him? And your answer is Creepshow. So I would say Creepshow. I think Bruiser is yeah. a really good movie, and that is an underrated. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah, okay, is yeah, yeah. Um, actually, tell us, tell us more about Bruiser, because I have to be honest. I saw it one time when it first came out, I, and I do not remember anything about it. I actually thought of Bruiser for whatever reason. I thought of Bruiser a lot while I was watching uh, Martin. Well, it's kind tell of the me, same. I'm, like it's got a very similar character. Like he's kind of like he, he's not. He's almost like a, a spectator in his own life. Like people push him around yes. and stuff, and he's he's very like non-confrontational. Well, what's so it about? Well, like, what's what's the movie about? It's about a guy who basically is just like he's he's kind of a putz. Like he doesn't. His wife is like taking advantage of him. And I think she like jacks off his boss right in front of him. Like. <laughs> yeah, like it's he's he's, he's a very like a very uh like. Okay, I think I may have not person. seen. I, I don't think I have seen this movie because it sounds like I would have remembered at least vaguely something like this. You know, he like yeah. he just he basically like he, you know, he's very non-confrontational. People walk all over him. And then one day he wakes up and he doesn't have a face anymore. It's just like a white like mask. And whether or not that's actually real or if it's like his hallucination or like his self image, I don't know. No, but then he goes no, on. I do remember. Is, isn't there like an. Is there an organized crime aspect that comes into it? I feel like there's like a mob hitman or something at some point. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> that happened. Yes. That's what I'm thinking of. That's what I'm thinking of. But yeah, it's like a revenge movie. It's decent. Um, I think uh, The Crazies is really good. Honestly, I feel like of all the movies, of the, even though the dead movies, like Day, I think, is actually the strongest, but is the least liked because it's so dark. I think it's the Alien 3 of the Dead trilogy, where Dawn and Aliens were both, like, big comic book adventures with, like, very clear-cut heroes and villains, and it's super exciting, and you're rooting for them, and then Day of the Dead is just about societal decay and, like, the breakdown of communication and a social structure crumbling, and everyone is awful, and they're mean and yelling at each other, and it's just really ugly. But it's so fucking good. It's just, it's so nihilistic. So good. And I think that's why people don't like it because it's not fun. Even though there is like little bits of comedy. Absolute, that's Sit absolutely. That's absolutely why have people shot. Like, damn. Uh, don't <laughs> like it as much. Um, uh, I actually love 
I, I'm in the weird minority. I love all three of the first Alien movies equally. No, I and just, I actually, I, love I actually love also all three of the Living Dead movies equally. Um, my favorite I, is my favorite is always whichever one I have watched most recently. That's yeah. That's yeah. actually yeah. how it always boils down to me. I think that. Um... I Dawn is my personal favorite because it had the biggest impact on me as a kid. I can endlessly rewatch that movie, but Day I think is a stronger film overall. Oh and shit! Alien I still is- haven't told my big Dawn. Of the, I'm sorry, Night of the Living Dead story yet. Shit! I can't believe. Okay, that's how we're gonna finish the episode. I've got an awesome Night of the Living Dead story okay. to tell. Um, but I feel like Day of the Dead is very similar to Alien Three. I love Alien Three. I love Alien Resurrection. I like all of them, but mm-hmm. it's like you have an autopsy of a 12 year old girl. You've got the family structure that was built in Aliens destroyed. They kill a dog. It's just an ugly fucking movie. But that doesn't mean it's not powerful. And they both have very similar Agreed. subtext. It's about it's about society crumbling and being rebuilt with its own little, like, fraction, like, its own little group. They create their own religion and stuff. It's exactly like Day of the Dead. But people don't want that because it's not fun. And that's stupid because some movies, I mean, it's okay for movies to not be happy. Some movies should hurt. That's, no, that's, um, like, that's exactly yeah. my argument as well for Dawn of the Dead uh, and um, Alien 3 is whenever can people people complain it's too bleak. I'm like, are you forgetting you're watching a horror movie? Yeah, and it's fun. It's fine. The other movies are fun or you can have fun with them. That's totally fine. But if your critique of them is it's too bleak or made me feel bad, it's like I kind of think you're forgetting what genre you're watching Absolutely. at the moment. Um, so. Um, Lucas, um, just thoughts on, let, let, let's condense this here, uh, thoughts on uh, George Romero's career and any other movies you want to, like, uh, highlight? Um, so, I, I, I really love Knight Riders, like, it's kind of goofy, but... Um, I, I knew think, you were going to bring it up. Yeah, I think it's kind of him, like, uh, making a movie about, like, himself and his career, but, like, doing yeah. it in this weird, like, hyperbolic kind of way where it's just, like... <laughs> bikers who wear armor and joust with each other for some reason. <laughs> they, they literally are doing like his political philosophy. They've eschewed society and they've rebuilt. Yes. Their own. Is that available on Blu-ray anywhere? I really need to revisit that movie. I haven't seen I it in think years. I, ooh, I I'll look know. it up for you real quick. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but keep going, Lucas, and I can. Yeah, no, I think I think that one like really is like. I, I'm actually when I read you know this week that Martin was his favorite, I was actually surprised that uh, Night Riders was not his favorite because it does feel like the most, you know, even if it's not like everybody's favorite Romero film, I do feel like it's the purest Romero film. Yeah, that's that my makes. recollection of it for sure. Oh yes, yeah. and uh, Shout Factory does have a Blu-ray out of Night Riders. Oh yeah. okay, cool. Um, but as far as like like sleeper favorites like again like yeah i'm kind of with you guys like i i kind of cycle w- uh, throughout the uh the original trilogy like i mean i'm like sometimes day is my favorite sometimes dawn is my favorite sometimes night is my favorite um i really just like those movies a lot mike um, did briefly bring up creep show which let's be a great on time. This, which creep creep show is like one of the greatest horror anthologies ever fucking made oh it's tom savini at the height of his career stephen king has drug tom out of height, of, height of his career george romero at in between dawn of the dead and day of the dead jesus christ yeah. creep show my god it's a masterpiece like so good well but this isn't the type of show to talk about creep show um did, did you have more to say lucas no i mean just like i mean i i would i would encourage people to watch night riders if they're like interested in in getting to know who george romero was um and and then also like yeah like i feel like day of the dead is just such a fun time i feel like it's the logical conclusion to the trilogy like i mean i don't know like i think even if you watch night of the living dead like uh, uh, like i would just be like where where else did you think this was gonna go (laughs) yeah right (laughs) yeah (laughs) um everything's collapsed people are eating each other uh, it's just of course it's gonna end in some crazy bunker where it's like military and scientists just arguing with each other and eventually killing each other (laughs) 
Um, the, yeah. <laughs> then, then I guess I'm just going to bring up one movie real quick that nobody's mentioned yet, and I still feel deserves a shout out. Monkey Shines. I think Monkey oh, Shines yeah. is actually under, like that's actually I, an underrated George Romero I, movie. I saw that in the theater. I saw that, that, you that did? in the theater. Really? Yeah, it was during one of those like 24 hour horathons that uh, I used to go to in Philly, and um, yeah, it was it was like the second or third movie they played, and I was like, that was. That was really good. <laughs> I don't know. It was one of those that it's, I always kind of overlooked for whatever reason. But I was it's like, not was badly good. made, but it's so silly. Like I, I don't know. It is kind of goofy. Like I feel like it. It's like I'll, It's weird because Alex, I love Silver Bullet. I'll accept Silver Bullet all Silver, day, but Silver Monkey Shines is just too was much. My first horror movie. I just of the of the. <laughs> I don't know. I like parts yeah, the of Killer Monkey Helper Shines. Monkey. It's, yeah. I think I think it's just so ridiculous that it's hard to take seriously. But like when he tries to suffocate himself with the dry cleaning bag and shit, there's some great stuff in there. But the sex I mean, there scene is too, a with like, the oh. episode. So yeah, based. I said I saw it in a theater, and that sex scene, like once she like gets on his face, like the entire theater erupted into laughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was that's yeah. uh yeah that scene that's quite a it's quite a. <laughs> it's quite a chair she gets. <laughs> so before we close out, I've got to tell my Night of the Living Dead story. So yeah. I, I told the thing already about my mom, but that's actually not my Night of the Living Dead story. My Night of the Living Dead story is that I went to college at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which is in Indiana, Pennsylvania, which is right by... Uh, I actually don't know off the top of my head. I'm not going to be bothered to look it up right now. The uh, small town where um, most of Night of the Living Dead was filmed. Evan City. And oh, what was it? Evan City. Evan City. And I've actually never been. I've known a lot of people have gone. I actually just never went myself. However, I would throw big Halloween parties in which I was involved in many student groups on campus. And I think there's a statute of limitations for everything I'm about to say um, that uh, because I was involved in like so many student groups and in charge of them, I had permission from the school that I could sign out like equipment and projectors and screens under my name. And I would throw these big Halloween parties in which my thing was if you got in the if you came into the door you had to take a psychedelic i had a variety of psychedelics <laughs> shrooms lsd um 2cb 2ci um occasionally some others but you had to take a psychedelic and we had projectors playing horror movies and the big thing with these big Halloween parties, and I also did it on smaller parties with just my friends and I just hanging out and drinking, is that in Night of the Living Dead, there's a scene during the news broadcasts that they're saying where the safe zones are. And Indiana, Pennsylvania gets announced as one of the safe oh, zones. Yeah. And so we would, I, at the college parties, we'd have it and everyone would go hushed for the announcement of Indiana, Pennsylvania as a safe zone. And everyone would then cheer and everyone would have to do shots. And keep in mind, we were very fucked up during this. And so, like... I, and, like, I was the one that, like, organized everyone, like, you, you know, Night of the Living Dead shouts out where we are at college right here. Because there's people coming from all over the state, all over the country. And I got really into doing these really, really big Halloween parties. And I would, every year, make it a center theme of in Night of the Living Dead, the entire party would go hush for announcing Indiana, Pennsylvania as a safe zone. That's, that's my cool. big that's my big night of the living dead story cool. that's cool i did you ever go to the roville mall before they remodeled it i'm banned from the monroeville mall for shoplifting a dvd copy of dawn of the dead and that's not a joke <laughs> my friend uh my friend eric um who did all the music for our movies he um he wrote, lived in pittsburgh for film school for a while so he when the dawn of the dead anchor bay blue or dvd came out he went to the Suncoast in the Monroeville Mall and bought it there on release day, and they didn't even know the movie was shot there. And he was very oh upset. God. That was back when there was just that, like, 
the zombie painted on that lit mural on the one side, and there's two black and white photos like by the security office. I went twice. When I went years ago, they had remodeled, like the fountain was gone and stuff, but it was still kind of the same. And then when I went back a couple of years ago with Wes Southern to do uh, the Living Dead weekend, it was completely different. But some of the shit was still the same. But it's just such, it's so fucking wild to like be standing in there. It's like holy shit, this is where they fucking made one of the greatest yeah. movies of all time. Like I, I've actually before I got banned there. In all fairness, the very last time I was ever there, not because I was banned. Um, it was just literally the last time I ever went there. Um, none of that is a joke of what I said, by the way. I did that was not a joke at all. I got I got uh, caught first and only time in my life trying shoplifting. It was like I thought it'd be a funny idea to shoplift Dawn of the Dead from that Suncoast video <laughs> in Monville Mall. I thought it'd be a funny thing to do, and I got busted and I got banned from the mall, and I just coincidentally never went back. But I've been there many times before, and I know what you mean that. There's parts of the mall that you can walk around, at least when I was there, and you can kind of see how it was from the movie, but then how some things got changed, and there's other things that are just kind of gone. Yeah, it, it looks very different now. A uh, buddy of mine, uh, Matt Blasey, he's got the wood paneling from the elevator. Oh, from I, Five Boy I, I, I know Matt Blasey very well, yes. Yeah. I, was say, I know that name. Yeah, he his Reeve, his son, was the star of White Doomsday. Um, but Matt was actually in Land of the Dead and Survival of the Dead as a zombie. He got to be killed in them, uh, which is pretty nice. cool. He's also a big, um, if people look him up online, Matt, M-A-T-T, uh, Balzi, B-A-L-Z-I. B-L-A-Z-I. It's Blasi. B-L- I'm sorry. Um, can you spell that for me again, please? B-L-A-Z-I. Yeah, he's actually kind of like a big um, horror location um like historian and he's really big and if you're into like uh what where movies were filmed and what they look like now um all of his social media accounts are very fascinating he's a he is like an exceptional horror movie nerd and he travels around all that all over of comparing what things look like when they were shot to what they look like now. And it's, it's very interesting to watch um, all of his travels. Yeah. He, um, he wrote the book eight days in the woods, the making of the Blair witch project. Yes. Recently. He's he also, he's trip. also from middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and he's also like Blair witch project, which yes, was filmed in Maryland, but is right across this fucking state line. And yeah. a lot of us are from that state line area. There was something in the, fucking water that did something to all of us absolutely yeah yeah i've known matt for years and years and years his like i said his son was the star of white doomsday so his his middle name is romero which is cool that's so cool um but yeah i went with him the first time he gave us a tour of the mall because if he wouldn't have been there i wouldn't have known what any of the shit was it looks so different yeah. but um yeah living dead weekend they get like tours you can go back in the boiler room and on the helipad and stuff on the roof and all that shit like it's I gotta go and and pay for the actual like tour tour one of these days because it's pretty rad. But so, um, you already finish up with the final question. Yes, I have got yeah. to. Uh, I'm it's past yes. my bedtime. I'm an old man now. Well, thank you so much for Mike talking with us. And the final question is is with every episode, do we recommend the movie Martin? <sighs> I mean, I don't know. I'm not really a big fan of George Romero, so I'd say no. Uh, no, <laughs> no. I actually really liked it. I was afraid. I didn't know what I was going to think of it. I need to watch it again. But actually yeah. talking about it, talking it through with you guys, I'm actually like, I'm definitely enjoying it a lot more now. Like thinking about it, it's like, yeah, I think there's some, there's a lot of meat there that we just need to see, like, you know, take time to process. But I would definitely recommend it. It's very slow. The pacing is very wonky. And if it was trimmed down by an hour and 38 minutes, I think that definitely would explain why. So there's some problems. And just to, re- it, just to reiterate, to make it clear what Mike's talking about is that the original cut, the George Romero one, it was two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. And so it was trimmed down by almost the length of the movie that we yes. did watch. So I think that that is uh, that definitely contributes to some of it. But I think mostly it's just a really interesting progression to see, like in his career, like pre Dawn of the Dead. I mean, you look at the crazies. The Crazy is the next logical step from Night of the Living Dead, and then he went to yeah. Dawn of the Dead. There's so much of Dawn of the Dead in The Crazies. Like, 
I always love watching filmmakers evolve through their career and, you know, see what they do next. And I think this is a really interesting footnote in Romero's filmography. I definitely recommend it. Just get the second sight Blu-ray of it because the, every other release that in the States is fucking awful and it, does, it looks like shit. Um, I watched the Blu-ray version as well, and the Blu-ray version looks great. And we made reference to it very early in the recording of the episode of that all the previous versions, which I remember watching as well, look like shit to such a degree that you can't tell what's going on. So, like, you, you really got to watch the new new new. Um, transfers of it lucas do you recommend it or not yeah i'm gonna give it a recommend as well i think um you know uh i mean maybe it's just because i'm a romero completist but i feel like um if you're um, a romero fan and you haven't seen it for whatever reason um like i said at the beginning of the episode i thought i saw it and then i was watching and i was like i don't remember any of this shit <laughs> um uh, i i would recommend uh checking it out i mean it is a little um it's weird. Uh, it's a movie that I think requires you to think about it. Like, because I, I really, um, while I was watching it, I wasn't, I can't say I was entertained, um, I, you know, uh, but uh, then when I started like really like thinking about it, like I was walking around today trying to unpack it as I was walking through my neighborhood and then like talking about it with you guys, I think um, I've definitely deepened my appreciation for it. I think it's one of those movies you need to watch a couple times and uh, kind of let let marinate um which i know is not a thing we do much with movies anymore i feel like you know but uh anyway that's a discussion for another time <laughs> I, i'm gonna face it off here um man i i i gotta be honest i am gonna go with a not recommend it um and i said that there was a lot of interesting things i thought about the movie um, though rewatching it, I kind of come away with my feeling that I felt with the first time in the movie, I, 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 I picked up on a lot more of the themes, a lot more of like the subplots, a lot more of the things going on than when I first watched it as like a teenager or like early 20 somethings when I was in college, I guess it was, but I'm watching it now. However, I find it really dull for two large chunks of the movie and we already saw him do night of the living dead and the crazies and i think this falls into i i this is actually i, I actually kind of made a little preview of it earlier in the recording of i grouped this in with season of the witch which i find season of the witch to be exceptionally dull as well and there's some good ideas at play but they're really dull movies and I think when, like, George Romero was talking about this being, like, super personal to him, it's him kind of getting out of his it, – it, it, was, it was his last gasp of his, like, art student career. And I think he was a great artistic director for many decades after this. But this, this honestly felt like an art student movie to me at times. So, actually – I would only say, like, watch this if you're a George Romero complete, completist, but I'd say, like, like watch the uh, three Living, Living Dead films, watch uh, The Crazies, watch, oh, no, watch, watch Creepshow, watch Creepshow, then watch The Crazies. Um, I put, I, I actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think actually Monkey Shines is a bit more enjoyable than this right now. <laughs> Like, you no, know, there's things to chew on, and there's things you can really academically chew on, but it's like, how good of a movie does it make? And um, it's interesting. I'm not saying it's bad. It's interesting, but that's my that's my opinion. I'd say so. We get we get uh, two out of three yeses. Two out of three ain't bad. No. <laughs> yeah. And um, thank you so much for being on, Mike, and for um, uh, anyone that's listening. So uh, Mike Lombardo, he makes movies, he writes books, he does all sorts of creative shit. Where can people find you at, Mike? Uh, they can find me at realsplatter.com. That's real with two E's, like a reel of film. Um, I'm most active on Facebook, 
Uh, just look up my personal profile. I have a real splatter page, but I barely ever update it. And uh, on YouTube, all the short films, and I'm occasionally on Twitter. Everything is under real splatter. If you Google me, you'll find me. I'm not the pedophile YouTube musician. That is a different Mike Lombardo. That's good to <laughs> differentiate between good that. Good to know. And, and I trust that we have an intelligent artist intelligent audience so you can see mike lombardo's name spelling in the description and i'm sure you can find them um also uh we have a patreon with bonus episodes we also recorded a bonus episode with mike before this um that we nerded out for about an hour about horror video games which was yes. super 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 fun and nerdy we got we got real nerdy in the in the <laughs> trenches in there so you can show. find that on our Patre- patreon which i think it's a dollar to access everything we're, we're we sell out cheap also for the yeah. record for anyone that is looking for us we have brought forward some ideas for episodes my name is jeff burke there's lucas magnum there is mike mike lombardo you you can find us for cheap if you want to buy us up for cheap mm-hmm. we could give you good concepts oh for the love of god um I, i'll um, get for quarters oh my god <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing next episode do we lucas uh we don't we don't um but, uh, we have no idea. I said we end the episode right now, and we talk about that at some point in the future, and everyone's going to find out a surprise. Yep, surprise. Starting <laughs> off the new year with a bang. 